welcome to everyone that's joined us. We, I really appreciate you joining Winescapes with Artists. I'm Deborah Klotchko, Executive Director and Chief Curator of the Museum of Photographic Arts. Our guest today is Cam Gardner. Um, uh, boy, I was thinking a lot about how to introduce you, Cam, because you're really a multifaceted individual. And I like to think of you as a superhero because by day you're a pharmaceutical executive, very successful businessman um, uh, involved in the healthcare industry. You started and co-founded uh, multiple um, businesses. And by night you're a talented photographer and, a, a, and, and really a, a master collector of, of images. So, um, so it's really great to have you here. And what I just want to uh, take care of is a little bit of business with everybody. We're going to keep everybody on uh, mute and the videos off so that we have a little bit better, um, uh, sharper images. Um, certainly feel free to chat, write chats uh, if you have questions, and we will take questions at the end. Um, so welcome to Winescapes with Artists with Cam Gardner. And um, so cheers. and. I think let's get started. So I'm going to do a little more introduction. Um, first of all, um, you're giving us a, a, a view behind you of where you store your collection. So we do have some slides that will share that. Um, I think what's interesting is for the purposes of this, of course, we're all really interested in your in your background related to photography. Uh, your day job is what pays for your addiction in in a lot of ways. Um, though you're you know you're obviously um, very very talented in in all that you do. But one of the things that uh, I'm sure most people don't really know is that you um, were a surfer growing up in Virginia Beach, and that's when you began. To photograph, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, no, it's it's sort of an interesting history. In our family, every time we went on vacation, my father carried a camera with him, and when we got back, we had slideshows. And I still have the drawers and drawers of slides from our family vacations, and I I suspect that was imprinted on me, and I became very fascinated by. Um, sort of visual representation and frankly the emotion that it held and so that you know that was sort of very formative for me in terms mm -hmm. of imagery it, you know i grew up always on the water and got very involved in surfing spent a lot of time and a, a lot of our friends wanted to see what they looked like surfing so i got a super 8 movie camera and i uh, i got my first camera and started taking photo pictures. And so that was really my first introduction to photography. Did you had to study it formally at all? Did you take any classes? No, I never did. I, I was like the typical kid. They, you, know, you sort of become a darkroom geek and try to figure it out yourself um, and really not knowing what you're doing. And, you know, that, I, you know, I when I sort of dig into something personally, I. I tend to get a little obsessive about it, and so became reasonably adept at doing my own printing and, and darkroom work. So, at what point did you uh, venture into collecting? Yeah, you know, it's it's, uh, it's probably been 25, 30 years ago, and I've always been enamored by photography, but never could afford to buy it. Mm -hmm. and, and I was so busy in building my career and, and, and frankly making enough money just to support the, the family mm -hmm. that I didn't have any discretionary income for a long time. And finally, I, I got to the point where I had a little discretionary income and I was able to start buying. We were on a trip to Carmel and I think it was the Western Weston Gallery that I went into and bought my first image, which was a Rolf Horn. Uh, and I still have that today. And, I don't know if you know Rolf or not. He lives up in the Bay Area. He actually worked for Michael Kenna, did printing for him for a period of time. So he's got a long history in photography. Never well known, but just I love the work. It was at landscape work, and he did a lot of stuff around water, so it, it appealed to me. And 
frankly, that sort of set me on the path of realizing I didn't know much. So <laughs> I better, if I'm going to spend money, I better start to learn it. So you are learning your, your photo history through your collecting. Yeah, you know, I, I have to admit I'm not very cerebral about photography as a collection. Photography for me is always about the emotional attachment that I have to imagery. I'm fascinated by people's backgrounds, but my daughter, who's a photographer and has a master's in fine art, she is... She, she knows everything about the history of photography. So I always have to call her to get filled in with a lot of the facts. You say that, but as, as we'll all see going through the slides, it's a very smart collection. I mean, the approach that you take, the images and the artists that you've selected, um, it, it may be emotional, but it's very, very smart. And um, so maybe we should look at some of the pictures and, and actually start talking about uh, the images, since that's what we're referencing. Okay. So Arturo, why don't you put up the slides for us? Okay. So we have an Ansel Adams behind you? Actually, that's <laughs> I yours. Have to, I have to tell the story of this. Okay. This is actually Chairman Powell's office at the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay. And um, I did an exhibit there that um, I think it was up for about nine months of 20 large scale seascapes. But he liked my work. And so I donated some imagery that. Um, is in his office. And so this was when I first met uh, Chairman Powell. Great. Next slide. So, oops. I'm getting there. <laughs> okay. Um, so we are gonna go through these chronologically. Um, and um, this one by William Dassonville is from 1905. Um, we're we're going to be showing a fair number, but if you have stories or what attracted you to certain images, um, I think that would be great because uh, collectors approach collecting differently. Uh, you know, some start out with a theme. Um, for example, Henry Buell collected images with hands in them. And it was amazing how many famous hands there are out there. Um, so um, did the formation of what you collected evolve a little bit over time? Yeah, you know, again, I, I come back to, um, it's more visceral to me. Mm -hmm. But once I, once I got into starting with a little bit of the landscape, I wanted something that sort of represented a period of time so that you could see early landscape photography and very contemporary landscape photography. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was interested in sort of seeing what occurred earlier. Um, you know, my limited early knowledge was that Ansel Adams was the one that sort of made Yosemite famous and, you know, this, this uh, famous view from the Overlook. Um, I thought he was the one that made it famous, but actually had been photographed and painted for many years before right. that. So that, that sort of felt like a good beginning place for um, landscapes. And then I was able to continue to sort of build the collection and landscapes sort of over a period of time. So let's go to the next slide. You talk about even using the term landscape a lot, and yet, in fact, there's a strong social documentary um, feel to a lot of your work. I mean, Lewis Hine and this um, uh, the cotton mill is a very powerful picture. And I'll let you talk about it. Well, social documentary photography is, um, again, it's a, it's more visceral to me, but, mm -hmm. and it's usually not one image that, that excites me, although this was one of my first. It's, I enjoy sort of having depth and seeing how people approach um, social documentary photography, like Mary Ellen Mark, how immersive she was when she got involved with the project, like 
Tiny, who that who was uh, I guess she met early on when she was a teenage uh, prostitute, street prostitute, lived off the streets, and followed her for almost thirty years, and photographed her for thirty years, and to sort of see a body of work in the evolution of um, somebody through the you know through the lens of how they lived their life was fascinating to me. So, do you collect? Um in depth, each photographer as much as possible, or is it just certain photographers? My preference is always to collect in depth because ultimately I view the collection as ending up at a museum or several museums. And I, to me, it's more important for a museum to have the depth of, of, of a photographer's um, works versus just a few iconic images. So my preference, when available, is to really get a lot of depth. Next slide, please. So Annie Brickman's is, this is really an exquisite uh, image. So I can see where you could um, be very emotionally drawn to, to this particular image. Yeah, I, I, this is another one that I just, when I saw it, I said, that's one I got to have. Um, and I can't even tell you why. I think in, in hindsight, I sort of describe it as sort of the transition maybe away from the pictorialist and, and sort, of, sort of represents a point in time of the evolution of photography. Um, but it also has sort of a, you know, you can read a lot into it. Um, you know, the fact that she was the subject of her own imagery, and I'm sure this was criticized highly, and the fact that she would be naked in, in her own images was was pretty brave. Um, and so to me, it sort of represents the power of women at one level as well. So it, 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 it rings for me on a lot of levels. Well, it's interesting too that you would, you know, if you go back to, though we're not going to, jump back, but to um, William Dassonville's image, and, and this one, Dassonville said that whether photography is or is not an art is no longer um, in question. It is. And that's exactly what you're describing with this picture. So to have both of these artists in the collection um, is uh, an important historical um, base, I think, to, um, to learn from. Let's go to the next image. This is lovely image, by the way. Bravo. Yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> we were actually at uh, one of the photography, um, I can't remember if it was APAD or one of those big events. And my wife, who usually doesn't come on those things, came with me and she drug me back to the booth that this was being exhibited and she says you got to buy that image and obviously you had to <laughs> at that point and it you know it's a it's it's to me it's sort of an unusual image but it's a very powerful image as well well for me it's unusual for bravo yes. um but it is a powerful powerful image um and and that's one of the things that we're going to see again and again is um very strong um visual aesthetic in the images that you choose for your collection. Can we go to the next image? Uh, Cortege and um, this kind of action um, that was really, uh, I think they're performing. Yep. Yeah, Cortez, I, I tend to think of more of the abstractions. Uh, mm -hmm that it did but to me this was just sort of fascinating because it at first view it it struck me as um something that was sort of sensational and maybe dangerous and then really it's just a performance but i don't know the, the visual how we visualized the image was pretty striking to me this um, so we have a question, um, which is how you look at vintage works versus works printed later in your collecting? Well, my, my preference would always be to get vintage works, but that's not practical. Mm -hmm. And particularly if you're going to collect, you know, 100 images from one photographer, um, financially, it's almost impossible 
if they're well known, to get that many vintage images. It's just extraordinarily expensive. But it, to me, it's not that important. I, I care more about seeing a body of work. And if there are a few really great vintage images that anchor the collection of that photographer, all the better. But um, it's, not, it's not a requirement for me at all. Uh, next slide. So it's really about the learning process, the education, which I think is um, uh, very important. Uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, The Decisive Moment, um, which is what we're seeing here. Yeah, he was pretty extraordinary at that. And, you know, the fact that he could pre-visualize this and then just position himself and, and wait for this to happen, to me, is... Um, just speaks to the importance of pre-visualization when you're doing photography. Um, let's move to the next slide. But so we looked at a, a 1905 image. What's the, is that the earliest date in your collection, or do you have earlier? What's the span of dates that you collect? You know, actually, I I had quite a few albumin prints, uh, mm -hmm. but I've donated all those. I think some of those went to MOPA because I didn't frankly have the storage that I was comfortable with albumin prints. Um, so I've, I've donated all those. So the, I did have earlier uh, okay. images. But. Dorothea Lang. Yeah, it's such a powerful image mm -hmm. um, in multiple levels. You know, and then you'll see actually there are quite a few California photographers in the collection. Brigman, we we already talked about. Mm -hmm. She was up in, I think, up in the Bay Area. I think right. as well as Dorothea Lang. Um, well, Dassonville, based in San Francisco, yeah. um, the Westons. Um, you also Bruce have Bruce. a fair number that touch in Chicago and the uh, Institute of uh, Design. Yes. So, um, next slide, please. And this Bernice Abbott is really quite wonderful. Yeah, I, um, one of the things I like to do when I collect photographers, and for example, you would see it in the Arnold Newmans that I have, is I like to get a lot of the really early images mm -hmm. that were atypical of the kind of imagery that they ended up being known for. So, you know, I have a lot of interesting um, Arnold Newman's that people would not identify as being taken by him. But in the context of the, the body of his work, it's important in terms of getting a sense of the artists and how they evolved. Well, let's go to the next slide because here is a fairly early Ansel Adams that we'll be seeing from 42. Yeah, and this, yeah. Was this no, printed in 42? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, <laughs> truthfully, it's not one of my favorite images. Um, and truthfully, Ansel Adams is not one of my favorite photographers. I love some of the imagery. Um, and I, I love the way he went about it and the things that he did for photography and really introducing marketing probably into photography and showing a lot of photographers how you could make a living at it. But um, you know, he's, he's, I felt like I needed him in the collection, but he's honestly not in my top 10 list. You know, I understand that. Um, his work is very theatrical, in, if you want to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's well-crafted. Um, I know he's very popular, um, but it, it's, it's, um, it's not it doesn't have the same resonance as a lot of the other work that you're showing us that that you're collecting yeah for um, me it doesn't have the emotional content so next slide please aaron siskin um so do you have quite a few aaron siskins yeah i have to admit i love callahan siskin ray metzger who you know Siskin and Callahan worked together extensively, and I think Metzger was trained under them. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love the work, and I love how they pushed the boundaries of photography, experimenting. Uh, they were very unique individuals, and um, a lot of strong imagery comes out of really the three of them. And you're loaning uh, Aaron Siskin to our upcoming uh, Aaron Siskin Mid-Century Modern Show, so thank yes. you for that. 
um, which we've moved to this uh, 21. So we moved it a year because of the current um, world situation. Uh, next slide, please. So is this in the collection because you collect portraits of photographers as well as their work? Yeah, it is. But, you know, I, I particularly love this because, you know, it's a one of a kind. Newman mm -hmm. had a habit of when he photographed somebody, he wanted them to sign back on the photograph something back to him. And, you know, I forgot what, what uh, was written here, but I, if something like why you would want to mess up a perfectly good photograph is beyond me. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's such, to me, that's such a powerful image. Mm -hmm. It really represents Newman's incredible ability to position people to communicate so much. But, it, you know, for me, to, you know, this probably is this, and there's a, um, let's see, I've got a, uh, a couple of others that are signed by him. Um, I'm blanking on um, the other two, but they're really fabulous, unique pieces. Well, Picasso, I have one that's actually signed by Picasso with a little drawing on it. Mm. So they're very unusual pieces. Great. Next slide, please. Iconic image. What can we say? Yeah, it it's uh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I would say. What can we say? You know, I, he was one of the first early ones that I collected in depth. Mm -hmm. um, but again, is it not one of my favorite photographers? Um, you know, it it again it, at an emotional level, the work doesn't resonate that deeply with me. I mean, there, he does a great job, well-crafted photographs, some very interesting imagery, but certainly not in my top 10 list. Next slide. Um, again, Esther uh, Bubbly. So, yeah. yeah. It sort of reminds me of the Salgado image that he mm -hmm. did in the train station, I guess it was. Uh, Obviously, this was quite a bit earlier. I tend to think about Esther Bubbly more of the the, uh, the bus series, which I thought was one of her best uh, series. Well, she was um, she was such an interesting photographer in terms of her subject matter. I mean, she really was interested in in the everyday life of people, yep. um, of ordinary people, and. Um, you know, working um, from the 40s to the 60s, you know, the golden age of photojournalism. Um, so, very nice. Uh, next slide. Uh, Louis Four. So, this is very unusual in the, in the group of images that we have. It's probably, uh, of everything that we're looking at today, it's the most manipulated image. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and again, it's not very typical of his work either. I mean, some of it pushes a little bit more abstract, but um, I just thought this was a unique piece. And it's, to me, when you're collecting somebody, if you have something that's a little out of the ordinary um, and you put it together with the other work that they do, it, it helps maybe express better the, the range that a photographer had. Great. Uh, next slide. Walker Evans. You know, it's really the only Walker Evans I, I have, and you know, not a great image. It, and I wish I could have collected more, but by the time I started collecting, the prices uh, got mm -hmm. to be pretty extraordinary for really good pieces. But it's a very unusual one. It's not one you normally associate with Walker Evans, which yeah, I think is intriguing. Yeah. Certainly wouldn't identify it as as uh, yeah. Walker Evans. Uh, next slide. Okay. Well, I've already talked about Callahan. I, you know. Yeah, but his, you can never say enough about Callahan. He's such a brilliant photographer. 
Well, MOPA did an, an incredible show of Callahan many years ago, mm -hmm. and, and Eleanor and Barbara actually came to town. And you hosted <laughs> dinner. Yeah, and we hosted dinner. Yeah. So, you know, that having that sort of connection to the photographer and the family, um, I get that much more rich, richness out of viewing these images. But I love the graphic nature of his photography. Um, and it's it's very quiet it's very personal and he photographed all the time and yet he felt that he only made maybe six good images a year i mm -hmm. mean this is how intense he was in and it was very personal his wife his daughter um and do you remember the dessert we had at the dinner eleanor's face on the uh cookies <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten. <laughs> I know, I know. And the only reason I remember, it's the one where she's in the water and her hair is spreading out. Yeah, yeah. And we reproduced it on the icing on cookies. Um, and I was so worried because we didn't get permission, but she loved it. And they <laughs> took all the extras home with them. So, um, so uh, next slide, please. Well, Eugene Smith was such an unusual person. Um, you know, you gotta love that kind of iconoclast. He, he just, he didn't care what anybody said. He was gonna do it his way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many times he got fired, but um, he always ended up with fights about what was gonna show up in the magazines. And he was an interesting person, but his imagery is very powerful and, um, well, I think we'll turn to remember the Kamoku in bath in the bath. Oh, the uh, Minimata series. Yeah, um, where he ended up uh, beaten up by the company thugs. Yeah, um, because he was photographing in Japan the um, the birth defects from the chemical runoff of a factory. And um, yes, yeah, actually, the family, if, if, as you well know, asked for that image not to be exhibited anymore. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Well, this one is from um, the Spanish Food Project that he he did in Spain, and um, we're in the '50s. He's photographing in uh, in these small in one or two small towns that really didn't have electricity, didn't have telephones, and here you see somebody who is this woman who's um, spinning by hand. Well, I have a great photograph that Arnold, Arnold Newman took of Eugene Smith where he's, it, it almost looks like a bedroom. He's sitting on a bed and he has all this clutter in the room. You can't see anything other than bottles and photographs all over the place. And it's just, it's an incredible mess. And it probably spoke pretty well to the way his mind was organized. <laughs> I think there was a drinking problem there, yeah, a serious yeah, yeah, drinking sure problem. Yeah, serious. Um, <laughs> and um, another interesting uh, fact about this work is um, he took 45 rolls of film in the Spanish uh, food project. And when it was uh, being edited for, um, was it Life magazine? Yeah. Um, they, Smith chose 118 images, and then it was edited down to 17, the final 17, um, which included the spinner. And um, it's still a powerful uh, humanist photography document to this day, so. It's beautifully com composed. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he had a great eye. Next slide, please. And now we're in the modern world with Bruce Davidson. Yeah, um, Bruce Davidson and Mary Ellen Mark were, were to me really interesting people. Bruce tended to stay in New York area for most of his work where, mm -hmm. where Mary Ellen sort of went all over the world. But they, they sort of immersed themselves the same way. Um, although I think Mary Ellen Mark was I, to me, nobody has surpassed her in terms of her commitment to, to really be involved and uh, immersed in her work. But Bruce Davidson had a lot of great series. The, the Gang series was a terrific mm -hmm. series. My favorite, actually, is the Subway series. It's, they're just beautiful images. Mm -hmm. So do you have any of the Subway series? I do. I have a pretty good collection of the Subway series. 
Um, and it's interesting to hear him talk about his work because uh, he, he asks permission, you know, he's not one of those photographers that, yeah. that really just goes and because um, he, he told a story about taking his, one of his daughters out to photograph because he would, uh, he had two daughters and he would alternate taking them out with him shooting and she saw um, a pimp sitting on the street and wanted to take the picture. And he said, well, you have to ask his permission. So she went up, uh, asked, he said, sure. He uh, she took the picture. So then Bruce went up and asked if he could take the picture. And the guy <laughs> said, no. He says, why, you let my daughter? And he says, for her, it was okay, you know. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I just thought that that was always a great sign of, of character, his character. Yeah. Uh, next image, Minor White. Yeah, you know, his, his sort of abstract landscape work was to me pretty compelling, mm -hmm. particularly in the, when I thought about the collection of landscape imagery that I have. So it just felt like it belonged in, in sort of the history of landscape photography. Uh, certainly a, a very well known uh, photographer that was also a, an extraordinary printer. And uh, really thoughtful and a great educator as well. I mean, um, moment in the sequences that we did, um, uh, Minor White's work was, I, it was extraordinary to see all of that work, which was meant to be seen uh, together in these sequences. So, but good. Um, thank you. Next slide. Yeah, I love Giacomelli's work. Yeah. I, I was I was very fortunate that I was able to buy quite a few prints early on before he was well known and before the, that large book would came out on his work. Um, it, it's just, you know, he hardly traveled out of Italy. And it's actually fun to look at his prints because he would hand retouch them with a ballpoint pen. <laughs> And so you'd see these black and white images and you sometimes see like a blue dot on them where he was trying to cover up. It, actually, most of the time he was covering up ashes from when he was smoking in the dark room and the ash would fall on the, on the, uh, on the paper uh, and leave a white spot. So, you know, very, very unusual guy. It did some very abstract haunting photography. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. So Diane Arbus, it's very intriguing to me that you collect Diane Arbus. What is it that um, draws you? I mean, it's it's um, powerful work. It's yeah, not to everybody's taste. Yeah, no, I, this this one really uh, resonated with me because everything was anti-war at that time. Mm -hmm. And here's this guy standing there with the button that says Bomb Hanoi. And... Um, it was just sort of so contrary to the things that were going on at the time that I thought it was a fascinating imagery in the context, particularly for me, because I grew up in that anti-war movement. Um, and the next slide is equally interesting because, can we go to the next slide? Uh, it's a portrait of Diane Arbus by yeah. Mary Ellen Mark. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, I, for me, Mary Ellen Mark is one of the most underappreciated um, photographers uh, in history. I, I think she's extraordinary. Um, next, well, as you were saying, she gets, she got very in depth with her work, was very passionate about it. Um, but let's go to the next slide. And Ralph Gibson, very poetic. <laughs> Yeah, really haunting too. <laughs> so so um, a lot of the stuff he did was very, very surreal. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I love the imagery that he did and it's, it's very different than a lot of work that you see. But you, you know, you see the shadow, you see the hand, but then you see the shadow on the wall where the light hits the hand. It's, it's an intriguing photograph. Mm -hmm. um, next slide. 
Well, obviously, Brett Weston was also a great landscape photographer, um, sort of wasn't recognized as well as he probably could have been con considering that he fell into this huge shadow of, of Edward Weston, um, but was a very accomplished and important landscape photographer. And a great abstract photographer as well. I mean, yeah. he was um, and a good printer. Very good printer. So let's go to the next. which I'm going to say is my favorite in this entire slide uh, deck. The yeah. Ray Metzger, I think, is underrated. Yeah, me too. And I, I just think that this is such a gorgeous image. It's brilliant. And um, yeah, and we got uh, someone saying awesome about it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Tor. Um, so talk about uh, Ray and what attracted you to him. Oh, I got, you know, it, again, it's more, it's more visceral than anything. I just love the imagery and I love this series of Pictus Interruptus. I, I tried to get as many of those as I possibly could. I probably have 15 or 20 in that series. I just thought it was a fabulous, unique series where he would just impose these objects in front of fairly ordinary things. Um, but the contrast created very unusual imagery. Um, let's next slide, please. Mary Ellen Mark, we've been talking a lot about her today. Yeah, that was, it, we talked about the series she did of, of Tiny. That, mm -hmm. that was quite a powerful series. I like the Indian Circus series as well some hard images to look at, but uh, it's a very powerful in-depth series of images, but most of her work was that way. I, I, I don't have too many from when she went into the um, asylum, asylum mm -hmm. and where she, I think she lived in there for a few weeks taking yep. photography, getting to know the inmates. Uh, that would be about as immersive as, as you could possibly be, but I think that speaks volumes as to how important it was for her to have a connection with the subjects and what that connection revealed over time. Mm -hmm. You know, too many photographers, particularly when they're doing portrait work, they're, they're very quick um, and you don't see the real character of the person and, until you get to know them and they relax a little. Um, and actually with Bruce Davidson, when he did East 100th Street, he used large, you know, larger format. He spent time with people. Um, so there's a different feel to, to that project than uh, some of the others, like Subway. Um, so let's go to the next, because we're going to go into something very different at this moment, which is your own work. Um, so uh, you work both black and white and color. Um, this is fairly recent. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, I, you know, I've done a little bit of everything. When I sort of got back into photography, when my career allowed, I did, I did wildlife photography, which, which I like more than anything was just being outdoors uh, and get to go to some interesting places. But it, it didn't really resonate that much other than the travel being interesting. And then I did a lot of um, travel photography, which I found very interesting. I spent three weeks in, in Burma. And, but ultimately, I kept, kept coming back to seascapes. And, um, you know, I, it, I just have a very uh, deep and emotional attachment to the water. It's, mm -hmm. it's sort of a form of meditation for me. And when I do photography, particularly mm -hmm. seascapes, um, I don't really care that much about what people think. I'm trying to represent how I feel and the peace that the, the sea gives me. Or the water gives me. Uh, and so it ends up being pretty minimalistic. Well, a true artist um, should not be worrying about what people think. You're really creating something that is um, speaking to you very directly. And your work is very meditative. Um, and I do recommend that people go and visit your website, which is Cam Gardner. And it, um, so you can see more of the work. And let's go to the next slide, because we only have two of your images, I think. 
Yeah, again, that's this is sort of what I like to do. It's, um, you know, I do a fair amount of post-processing. I do my own printing. You know, this is a case there wasn't a lot of post-processing, but to be honest about the photograph, if you look on the edges where the land, where the, the water is around the sides, mm -hmm. there's actually a thin strip of land on each side. And I removed that because it, it, um, it wasn't as calming to me. And by removing that, I allowed to float in space and time for me. So I don't hesitate to sort of manipulate photographs if it, you know, more closely approximated how I was feeling when I took the photograph. Um, so why don't we go to the next slide where we get to see uh, where you keep your work. So why don't you tell us about how big is your collection now and, um, you know, the, the way that you store and it's about the collection's probably about fifteen hundred images now. Mm -hmm. it, I probably had it total maybe twenty two hundred, twenty five hundred, but I've donated a lot of images over time, and I I continue to do that every year. Um, Next you know, slide. They're, most, they're mostly stored in flats. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of they're stored in the drawers and flats there. And it's you all know. inventoried. Yeah, Mike Molno comes in mm -hmm. once a week. Um, he's got a master's of fine arts and he sort of manages the collection for me. And we try to rotate out imagery in the house and then we loan out to museums. And I think the hard part for me is that it, it, um, it doesn't feel very good to have all these images sitting in a drawer where people can't see them. Mm -hmm. it, it feels a little pointless. So um, anytime that I can have people come in and view the, the works, uh, I, do, I do that frequently and loan out Im images frequently as well. And as I begin to think about, you know, the collection going forward, that's why I wanna be very thoughtful about how I donate it, the images and where they go, because I want them to be viewed. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Um, I think uh, we've seen this one. Let's go yeah, to the next a, one. Just a different angle. Yep. So you see some of the Bruce Davidson subway series up mm -hmm. there. And, you know, I try to keep a reasonable book collection as much as space is allowed, particularly the photographers that I collect. So um, this is actually the end of our slide. So uh, what I'd like to do is um, I have some questions for you as, as people may have their own questions, but um, what's the image that uh, you really wanted that got away, number one? You know, it, it was actually a, a Diane Arbus image of the boy holding the two grenades. Yep. <laughs> it was very disturbing, but I don't know why um, I was bidding on that at auction. And that's sort of still a um, question why I let that one go. And then what are you currently looking for or focusing on? Or is, is it, um, yeah, what are you currently hoping to collect? You know, right now I'm, I'm spending more time on organizing and contemplating how I donate and you mm -hmm. know, where, where I give imagery away. So right now, there's nothing that I'm really looking at to acquire. Okay, I have a question. Um, I thought I did, where'd it go? Uh, what do you think of the technical advances in photography that allow the ability to capture speed and texture? Well, I, I'm all for advancements in photography. I'm not a traditionalist, um, you know, we always talk about Ansel Adams. People don't realize how much he manipulated imagery in the dark room. And we're seeing more multimedia type of art where photography gets integrated into other works of art. So to me, I, I love it. I think it, anything that furthers creative expression should be embraced. Um, do you, uh, we can let people know that um, in spite of the fact that the museums in San Diego are closed right now, 
Uh, oh, someone says, I saw the exhibition at SDMA this morning. It reminded me how beautiful black and white photos can be. Um, you currently have a um, hundred plus of works from your collection that is just opened at SDM, the San Diego Museum of Art. Um, and hopefully it will be extended so that we can see it after um, the museum's open again. But do you want to talk about that process of selecting and um, working with the museum to put that together? Yeah, no, <laughs> it was actually very fascinating because I, I really haven't been involved in that before. And one of the curators at SDMA, you know, I decided to give her the latitude to, to really explore how she wanted to present the imagery. Um, she knew the space better. She had more experience as a curator than I did. It, you know, I wouldn't have chosen a lot of the images or I would have had other images, partly because they emotionally resonate with me, and so I want to share those. Um, so, you know, it's, um, but I thought they did a sensational job in hindsight. It was also for me, uh, an interesting experience because I tend to see photographs on my wall in the house and don't get to see them too often as a total collection. Mm -hmm. And we, we actually went through it last night and to see them all together like that laid out in an organized way was, um, I, I don't know, it was, it, it was, um, I had an appreciation of the value of what a collection can mean to a museum. Mm -hmm. The other and, thing that was fun to me that I have to mention is that the last image in there is actually my daughter's image. Um, and I should mention that she's a photographer. Uh, actually, she does a variety of things. She does uh, performance video. She has a piece now at the, um, uh, the National Portrait Gallery in DC that's part of the Outwin exhibition. And so she does a lot of performance video, but she does a lot of photography as well. And she's currently living in Mexico City doing art. Um, so it runs in the family. Um, and, you know, that's the great thing about uh, putting a collection together the way that you have by in-depth and um, uh, the time, you know, the vast time period, because, um, someone else could go in and curate a completely different exhibition. And it's always interesting to see from somebody else's viewpoint how they interpret that. Um, so the next time it'll be different. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it could, be, it could be very different. I could think of all kinds of variations on the theme um, that for me personally probably would be more interesting. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, someone asked, is your collection area climate controlled? It's not, and it's part of the reason I want to donate it. And oh, I, I, I keep okay. the temperature at a reasonable level, and, and obviously the humidity here is, is pretty reasonable, it stays around 50%. So it's, it's somewhat controlled, but not, it, the temperatures really should be lower. And then I just got a note from our board president uh, that MOPA had an installation, an exhibition, Pictorialism to Modernism, and your collection was part of that, a uh, portion of your collection was part of that exhibition. Is that right? <laughs> uh, I, I don't, not that I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the, or, only other, the only other exhibition that's going on that includes some of my photographs right now are the, the Mary Ellen Mark Polaroids. The, those 20 by 24 Polaroid series mm -hmm. that she did of twins and graduation. Um, and those are up at SDMA. Okay. Um, and do you have anything else you want to say or add? No, I, I, I can't think of anything myself. It's, you know, been a pleasure to do this. And, uh, you know, I truly wish more people could see the photography collection because that's, it, it belongs in people's, it should have the opportunity to view and not, not be sitting in drawers. Well, I'm sure it will. Um, and thank you for being a great steward of the collection because that's really um, where it begins. And again, because you have such great vision and a great eye for it, it's, um, it's been a pleasure to have you share work with us. 
and um, there are people that want so um, there are some people who are collectors that might want to reach out to you. What I can do is forward you their, their either email and or phone number. And if you want to get in touch with them, uh, you can. How's that? That, that would be terrific. Perfect. Um, so what I'm going to do is say thank you. And um, I appreciate your time in all of this. And again, um, thank you for the beautiful work um, and the spectacular work. Um, it, it's made my day, it's made my week, and um, again, um, it's, it's wonderful to see such a, an important collection. Thank well, you, thank, Cam. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you, everybody, for participating. All right. Um, thank you all.